Let's pray. And Father, we do acknowledge we're here this morning, Father, because of you, because you're our God and our Savior. And Father, I pray that as we get back into Isaiah, you open our eyes and reveal yourself to us. Reveal to us what you did to Isaiah. Uh, show us, Father, what you want us to know concerning who you are and what you're doing in the life of all of humanity to save us through your son Jesus and how you prophesied that 700 years before he came and how you prophesied his return also. We're still in our future. I pray, Father, again, open our eyes, help us to see what you're trying to communicate to us, I'll remove our whatever distractions so we can focus on and hear you. <clears throat> we thank you, Father, for your love for us, and I pray we'll see that in these passages. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we haven't been in Isaiah for three weeks, so let's make sure we're in the right context. Um, in the book of Isaiah, the prophecy, the first five chapters, introduce the whole book. Chapter 6 is Isaiah's call. Chapter 7, 8, and 9 emphasize Emmanuel, God with us. And for the Israelites, they're living in gross immorality and gross sin, rejecting God, yet God still communicates to them, I am with you because they're God's people. And his desire for them is to draw them back to him in redemption and salvation. Then picking up in chapter 7 still, Assyria is an issue because they are invading. Judah and Jerusalem are depending on Egypt to save them, not God. Then Babylon to them and not God. And the text is throughout saying to Israel, to Judah, God, your only Savior. And in the end, when the Assyrian army is outside the gates of Jerusalem to destroy it, God demonstrates one night, one night, he would save them and decimate the Assyrian army to the point that what's left packs up and goes home, and never returns. So God said, I am your Savior, and God proved so to Judah and Jerusalem, but they still aren't turning. Chapter 40 is a huge transition in Isaiah. Because chapter 40, Isaiah goes from dealing with the Assyrian threat to announcing the Messiah, the servant of God, who will bring salvation. And we know that because in chapter 40 it says, Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak kind to Jerusalem and call out to hear that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord, Lord's hand double all her sins. Then verse 3, the key verse the following, A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert the highway for our God. And it continues. <laughs> well, over in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those passages are applied to John the Baptist, who's the voice crying in the wilderness. So we know chapter 40 of Isaiah is a transition to focus on Messiah. And the term in Isaiah is servant. He's called the servant in Isaiah. It's the Messiah. It is Jesus. And, and from 40... Through 56, it clearly communicates Christ's coming, Christ's first coming, his life, his ministry, his suffering in chapter 55, I think it is, to the point of death on the cross. Yes, and the fact that God provides his Savior and it is Jesus and is the Messiah. In chapter 56, there's a transition again. This transition is to focus on the second coming of Christ. And we know that because the verses of chapter 56, again, communicate a new covenant because the foreigner and the eunuch are welcome into the worship of God and everybody else. That can only be done after Jesus come and fulfilled the prophecies of the law and made it possible that to happen. And it continues with the second coming, communicating that fact and that truth that there's the first coming of Christ, 40 to 56, the second coming of Christ. So we're in the section now of the second coming of Christ. And last week, chapter 60, focused on Jerusalem, the city. And we discussed either it's the new Jerusalem at the end of all time or it's the Jerusalem of the thousand year reign. And I think it's more the thousand year reign Jerusalem because it describes the people both inside and out as somewhat like we are today. 61 continues this picture of the second coming of Christ and the events that take place during that time. So, we begin chapter 61, verse 1, and that's where you should be, and I'm going to go to Luke 4, not you, me, and start reading in verse 16, and you can be paying attention to 61, verse 1, and you notice when I start reading the same thing. So Luke 4, beginning in verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, 
and as was his custom, he entered a synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to, the, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, and the eyes of all the synagogue were on, fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus read Isaiah 61 and that synagogue and said, Today this scripture is being fulfilled in me. So in Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to the blind, uh, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Verse 3, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So Jesus communicates to Isaiah 61, I think, he communicates to the prophet, and then in Luke he reads that verse to tell the world the Messiah is here. He identifies himself as the Messiah. Now, Max wrote this a week or two ago in one of the videos that there are eight verses proclaiming, prophesying Christ's coming compared to one of his birth or something along those lines. He has fulfilled all these prophecies. We know this because in 250 B.C., before Christ, Septuagint was written, which has these prophecies in it. No way it could be written afterwards. We know the Bible and the Old Testament speaks of Jesus, and he lived as was defined in the Old Testament, died, rose again. So he is fulfilling the prophecy, and it continues. I love, though, that he reads these very verses, and it, it goes back and forth, because in my mind, I think Isaiah had a glimpse of the future and knew what was coming in the Messiah, in the Christ. So he identifies himself in Isaiah 61. He reveals to Isaiah who he is. He describes or defines his ministry, good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captive, freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And then verse 3 is a word picture of the victory or the celebration or the giving of his, granting of his freedom to the people who he redeems. So and as you know, Hebrew is, is full of word pictures, and, chapter, and verse 3 is a good example of that. So he communicates in the midst of this discussion of the second coming, he came to save. He came to free people who are bound up in their sin. He came to redeem. He came to shine light in the darkness. He came to bring salvation to all who were lost, who were in bondage to sin, who were enslaved to sin, who had no hope. He came to bring hope. So Christ comes not to judge his first coming. He comes to save. He came to bring salvation, to bring peace, joy, to give the truth of how humanity is to know God Go ahead, Lori. Okay. <laughs> we don't want Josh to escape. And I emphasize that because the second coming of Christ is judgment. The first coming, the cross, his death for sin, the resurrection, he came to save. Everything about Jesus we should be preaching today and sharing today is salvation, not judgment. Judgment comes later. In fact, at no point does the Bible tell the believer it's your job to judge or convict. It's our job to represent Jesus, not convict. The Holy Spirit does that, not me. So our emphasis here is based on the Bible is to share the hope of Jesus. The judgment will come, but that's in his hands and not our hands. So don't forget, the primary message we have about Jesus is he's come to save, he comes to help, to free, to release, to bring light in the darkness. Uh, verses 4 through 9 are word pictures of Jesus' salvation. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations, and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers will stand and pasture your flocks, and farmers will be your farmers and your vine dressers. 
but you will be called the priest of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will have a double portion, and instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion, and their land everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice, I hate robbery, and the burnt offering, and I will faithfully give them, give them their recompense, and make an everlasting covenant with them. Then their offspring will know among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them will recognize them because they are offspring whom the Lord has blessed. Again, a lot of that is a word picture of, I think, the thousand-year reign of Christ. The saved, the believers who are there, who reign with Christ, are seen as priests to God because we are now priests to God. The believer now is the priest who goes up to the world to represent God, to communicate his love, his desire for saving people in grace. So the picture of the thousand-year reign is, as Christ reigns, he is still communicating grace and mercy and the gospel to all who are respond to that. And the people who are in Jerusalem with them, who reign with them, the saints, the believers, are the priests who communicate that. And the word picture is, that's their job. Somebody else farms their land, brings in the harvest, provides for them. Their job is to represent Jesus. So all believers at this time are pastors, if you will or evangelists, or priests, communicating the gospel to all in the world who have not yet responded to the fact that Jesus is king and reigning in Jerusalem. So we're pictures of the, of the ease of life or, or the fact that they are respected and honored as those priests. The saved respond to the message, verses 10 and 11. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland. And as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts. And as the garden causes the things sown in it to spring up. So the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Again, a word picture. But the word picture is that the believers are rejoicing in the presence of Jesus in their midst. I, again, think it's the thousand-year reign of Christ. I think it's describing, as we asked earlier, Diana, what are we doing? Who's there? And the whole picture is the people that reign with Christ for a thousand years are there worshiping, praising, but also being bearing testimony to all who are here on the earth concerning Jesus. I think. Again, Hebrew and English, a lot of word pictures, but also there's not a lot of exact detail. But that's where God has led me with the text and the context of 56 through 66 being the second coming of Christ. So during that time period, the thousand year reign, there is life, there's activity, and there's evangelism. In the city of Jerusalem, there is Jesus, and he is the glory of all in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Verse 8, he points out the false worship of the Israelites. We'll come back to that after we do chapter 62. Chapter 62 discusses the city of Jerusalem, the city of God. Verses 1 through 5. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not keep quiet, until her righteousness goes forth like brightness, and her salvation like a torch that is burning. The nations will see your righteousness, and all kings your glory, and you will be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will, de will designate. You will also be a crown of beauty in the land of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. It will no longer be said to you, I forsaken, nor to your land will it any longer be said desolate. But you will be called, my delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. The glory of God fills the sea. Brightness, a torch. The world will see a renewed city of Jerusalem. Globally, the world will know it is the glory of God in the city that makes it the brightness that it is, that makes it the city of glory that it is. It will be a city of joy and righteousness. And that is so because Jesus himself is there and he makes it so. It is the presence of Jesus that's the glory of the city. That's what the world will witness during the thousand year reign of Christ. Verses 6 through 9, the watchmen. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. 
All day and all night, they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his strong arm, I will never again give your grain as food for your enemies, nor will foreigners drink new, your new wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it will eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it will drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. And again, the word pictures are there. The watchman, I'm not sure what that means. Possibly angels who are there to remind God of his promise to Israel, to Jerusalem, to his people. Um, or just a word picture communicating, it's never been before God, what he's doing, fulfilling his promises. Uh, verse 8 and 9, the city will belong to God's people and no others. So it's a place where the saved reside and not those who do not believe in Jesus. Verses 10 through 12. Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up a standard over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. And they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called sought out, a city not forsaken. And again, it's the thousand-year reign of Christ, a new Jerusalem, if you will. Um, the God's people and only his people have a place in Jerusalem with God. The chapter is victory song. In fact, it's one of these two both is a victory song of God's people. God's emphasizing his victory over sin and redemption of man. God's revealing our place in eternity with him. It's hard to read this and really, I think, for me anyway, to grasp what's going on. Uh, chapters 4 to 56, we knew what that was because it's fulfilled in, in the New Testament. We can match verses in Isaiah to New Testament. We know it talks about Jesus specifically because he fulfilled the prophecy. You can see exactly how it all falls in place. But from 56 on, it's in my future. So I really have to rely on reading the passage over and over and asking God, reveal me what you want me to know. And he may say, I don't want you to know anything but what it says. Just go with, it's going to happen like this. God will, will win, will reign victoriously in Jerusalem for a thousand years, and people will be there, and it'll be a glorious place of rejoicing and praise and worship. That may be all there is to it. When we get there, we'll know for sure. But again, it's that kind of prophecy that's not been fulfilled yet. So we're waiting for that moment. However, what really got my attention was verse 8. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery in the burnt offering. In the midst of this beautiful discussion of the Jerusalem and Christ reigning, he throws this verse in of I hate robbery in the burnt offering. And you go back to chapters 58 and 59, and the whole chapters talk about their false religion, their false worship. Now, let me clarify false religion. It's not they worship pagan gods, although they did. But God's primary problem with the Israelites, the Jews, his people, were they said they worshipped God, went to the temple, offered sacrifice, went through the motions, but they had no idea who God was. There was no submission to God as God. There was no relationship with their God. It was one more religious duty that they did to make sure they appeased all the gods. They had no care for God, no love for God. No concern for God. They were Jews. This is what Jews do. So they did it. That's verse 8. I hate robbery in the burnt offering. It was a false offering. It was a false worship. It was a social event, if you will, every Sabbath. There was nothing about knowing God, worshiping God, submitting to God, obeying God, a relationship with God. And I that sticks out in my mind because in these beautiful chapters describing second coming, in times, there's the two whole chapters. Now, this verse again that say, I hate your false worship. I hate you pretending to be a believer, and you're not. I hate you calling God, God, Jesus, my Savior, and you have no clue who that is, what that means. There's no obedience. There's no submission. There's no surrender. Like I say, that got my attention. Because the, the chapters are definitely a prophecy of his return and his glorious reign, but it's kind of shadowed by the statements of hypocrisy. But, and you look at our world today, 
I'm sorry, but much of what is called the church is hypocrisy. It's a social event. It's an entertainment event. There's nothing about Jesus died on a cross so you can know God in a relationship. He didn't die on a cross to create a new religion. But for many, it's a religion. And you've heard me say a thousand times, religion is man-made. Man-made religion so man can control man and get rich. That's obvious. Look at many of the denominations out there. It's about bringing people in, bringing money in, and controlling people. And a really good example is Muhammad. Muhammad was Arab. The Arabs in Muhammad's day were splintered, fighting each other and everybody else. He wanted to unite all Arabs into one. Well, he saw the Jews, one religion, one God. He thought, you know what? Those Jewish people got, got the right idea because they are united under their one religion and one God. So Muhammad said that Allah came to him, spoke to him, and gave him one religion with one God. And he used that to unite the Arabs. It worked. They did. And you see what happened. They took over the Middle East. They expanded through Northern Africa, up into Spain. All that was through Muhammad realizing in religion, I can unite my people, become a formidable force, and do what I want to do. And he did. Man is not, we figured out religion. We use it to control people and get them to do what we want them to do. Same thing happens to Christianity with the false side of Christianity. There are denominations and people who use the teaching of Jesus to create a religion to control humanity. God says, I hate that. And so for you and I, we're thinking end times. How can I make sure I'm not that hypocrite? Well, I know you're not. I see you every Sunday at least, sometimes more often. How can I make sure the world around me knows I'm not that false worshiper of the true God and Jesus my Savior? How can I represent Jesus in my culture, in my environment, so the world knows I'm for real? And that really, to me, is the question that I think we need to answer. Because if we are in the end times, the end of the age, if Christ's return is imminent in the next five, ten years, if we go through the rapture, those who are left behind that we know and we love and we care about, what are they going to think of me? Well, he was a sorry representation of Jesus. <laughs> you know? In fact, what got my attention also these past three weeks is thinking about who do I know who have communicated to me they do not know Jesus as the Bible describes. They may acknowledge he exists, like Satan does, but they don't know him like the Bible defines know him. <laughs> So who are these people? Then I put myself in their shoes. The rapture happens. They're standing on there looking up like, holy cow. And you put that face to that reality. I know that person will not be raptured. They'll be left behind. If it's somebody I really care about, well, that bothers me. How can I go to that person today in a non-judgmental way, as Christ wasn't judgmental, Communicate to them, I am concerned because you communicate, you don't understand Jesus like the Bible defines. Well, how does the Bible define Jesus? He came to save us, John 3 16. For God so the world, He has only a Son, whoever believes in Him shall have eternal life. From that belief is a knowledge that He is God, I am not. Acknowledge that I can do nothing to make God want me, love me, or care about me. It's totally in God's hands, grace. I have nothing to change the fact that I'm a sinner. I've done it. I can't change it. I can repair what I broke, stole, or whatever. I can buy a new one. But it doesn't change the fact that I did it, that I'm a sinner. Only God can change the fact that I'm a sinner. And he did that through Jesus, his son, who did not sin, who was perfect, the Lamb of God, who sacrificed his life on the cross for me. He died in my place for my sin. So that if I humble myself before him and surrender my life to him, he comes into my life, removes my sin, and I now am without sin. That's the Bible definition of knowing Jesus. And it leads to a personal, intimate relationship. It's totally spiritual, but you can see it physically, mentally, emotionally. But you enter that relationship with God the Father through Jesus the Son. That's what the Bible teaches from beginning to end. God's whole purpose and point is, I want to be in a relationship with you. I want you to know me as your God and your friend, as your Savior, as your King. 
That's the whole point. Man messed it up with religion. But for God and through his son Jesus, it's about I love you, I created you, I want you to be in my presence. Your sin ruined that, but I will remove your sin, that barrier, through Jesus. Okay, how do I go to somebody who I know today will be left behind and communicate that to them without sounding judgmental or arrogant or religious <laughs> and, and, and think about it. Go to somebody and say, look, I'm here because I care about you and I'm concerned because I know Jesus and I don't know if you do. And I just want to make sure you do. And they may accept that or they may say, I don't want to talk about it. But I doubt if it's your sister or your brother or your parent or your child or your grandparent, they're going to say, get out of my house. I don't see you again. I doubt that's going to happen. If we come truly bathed in love and communicate that love, they're probably going to listen. And I've done that with multiple people. And I've yet to have one tell me, get up and leave. Then I knew. I've had strangers say, get off my front porch. But never someone that knew me they go away because they knew my heart they knew I really did care so I encourage us again verse 8 for the last four weeks been burning a hole in my head because in the midst of this great discussion of Christ's return and reign and all the glory and the praise and the worship I hate robbery in the burnt offering chapter 58 59 where he just talks about their false fasting their false worship their false Sabbath I want to get it right I want people that I care about, that I know, to know that Jesus is real. And it's more than acknowledging he exists. It says in James, Satan acknowledged God exists. Big deal. It's knowing him. It's surrendering to him. And then allowing him to change me from within. That's, that's all there is about Jesus and God in the world. So again, for Christ, to God, to put this in the, in the prophecy, red flag for me. Make a point to highlight we want to make sure we represent Christ correctly. Because the world is not. Let's pray. And Father, I pray you will encourage us and convict us if necessary and affirm us, Father, in our walk with you, our faith with you, our knowledge in you. Move us, Father, to be that witness to the people whose lives you placed us in. Move us, Father, to want to be that witness. And look for opportunity to communicate your love and your grace without judgment, without pointing out sin. Simply to say, I care about you. I have met Jesus. I believe he's real. And I would like for you to at least consider the possibility that he is real. Because one day, you won't have that chance anymore. So show us, Father, to be that loving example, that loving witness. And show us, Father, when, how, and who to approach for you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen.